the sound and video getting through? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Minister Audrey mm -hmm. Tom. Yeah, just call me Audrey. Who yeah. has been uh, uh -huh. communicating with you? And today, our uh, head of uh, Professor uh, Fujiwara will introduce you to our students first. Hi, Fujiwara Sensei, please. Uh, uh, hello, Audrey, if I may. Uh, sure. uh, uh, I'd like to cut the formality, uh, but just wanted I want to thank you uh, in joining uh, a workshop here um, for global leadership. Um, I don't think um, Audrey needs any introduction. Uh, a child prodigy, a prodigy, a genius of digital transformation. Um, there are so many things that um, she has done. Uh, but what strikes me uh, reading um, her her words is how liberating it is. Um, it really um, makes you feel better about yourself as you are with all the limits, strength, hopes, weaknesses, fears. And uh, whenever Audrey talks about society, it is a group of actual living people with their limits and hopes. And nonetheless, um, leaves a wide possibility of connecting to each other. And that, of course, is in the very true sense what civil society is supposed to be, aside from all the words that we political scientists add to that. So uh, without further ado, um, let's get started. Um, Audrey, um, so how should it go? We have a great mm -hmm. number of um, questions from students. And yeah, there's like 51 questions. I wonder how right. we can get around to answering them in just 30 minutes. That's like, what, 20 seconds per question? <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, if you're OK with that, perhaps uh, I would just uh, share uh, what um, people have uh, already uh, asked uh, on Slido, and I try to answer as many as I can. Um, do, do you need a screen sharing, uh, or is it okay if I like highlight this? Do everybody see both my screen uh, and myself? This is good. Okay, so um, I will not. Um, read out the entire question uh, in the interest of time. But if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to enter either on Slido, which they will show in the latest question part, uh, or just raise your hands and uh, use the voice uh, to ask questions if that's okay with you. Right, so the first question, um, basically, uh, Internet access, like access to water or electricity, uh, is a human right. Uh, universal broadband is the campaign promise of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen uh, five years ago now, uh, and we've really delivered it. So anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, even on the tip, the top of Taiwan, if, if you don't, uh, for 16 euros a month for unlimited data, it's my fault, like personally my fault. People email me saying, hey, I'm in this, you know, uh, hotel quarantine. Uh, that I don't have good reception, I have no telecom access. You say it's a human right, I don't have human rights. Uh, it took me like half an hour to send this email. And then two weeks after what we made sure there's a new like 4G tower <laughs> near that particular quarantine place. So we take that very seriously. And indeed, this is really the, the same question as asking, you know, uh, I feel democratic transition caused a gap between people who cannot read uh, versus people who can read. The freedom of information means nothing thing for people who cannot read um, in either braille uh, or visual ways, right? So which is why we make sure that literacy uh, is a human right and that we make sure it's universally included. And so the same way, digital competence need also be a um, universal right and the public infrastructure that needed to be invested in it is very important. So um, I think this is just a, a given and there needs to be a lifelong education as well. And instead of literacy, which is like reading, uh, the digital where it's more like competence, which is more like writing, more like producing the media, the narrative, and things like that together so that people can become active citizens. After all, that's what the internet is for, is for bi-directional, multi-directional communication. Um, the uplink uh, also needs to be used, and that applies to the democracy itself, which is the next question. 
I think uh, the two most active groups on our national participation platform, join GOVTW, uh, are exactly around 16, 17, uh, one group, uh, and the second most active are 60, um, 70s people. Uh, and my um, hypothesis is that those two age groups have more time on their hands. Uh, the other age groups are more busy uh, but <laughs> with business. Uh, and, but also, it's quite clear that these two age groups care more about the long term sustainability more about uh, you know how to save for the future generations rather than withdraw from the um, future generation uh, to the short-term benefits as some uh, people um, sometimes do think that way right so I think the sunflower movement definitely made the long-term thinking NGOs those thinking about uh, long-term environmental sustainability the human rights situation and things like that they feel less uh, alone because previously they were communicating only to a small slice of the society, but suddenly because of the sunflower and the 20 or so NGOs banding together, it became cool again to talk about these things. Uh, and then uh, even for a very small scale um, NGO, now it's possible after the sunflower for through crowdfunding, crowdsourcing and so on, for them to connect to other social innovators and social entrepreneur. And because it become cool, it become also a core cool entrepreneurship project. It become a core cool thing for universities to encourage students to start entrepreneurship projects that take care of the human rights situation uh, through a fair trade of cotton. Um, it's a very recent example because I was just uh, from the Taoyuan City's uh, social innovation exhibition uh, where they show like very uh, organic, environmental friendly and also um, very good um, like um, relationship with the land and so on, a co-op produced uh, organic cotton. And so that uh, became a very hot topic for Taiwanese young entrepreneur as well. And because they're um, quite young, literally uh, just around 18 years old, there's no failure, right? If they start an idea and didn't match the crowdfund, didn't get a crowdfund to go, they just write a paper about it. Uh, that's their capstone project. There's no uh, sense of failure if the, you pivot like three or four times um, during your uh, undergrad um, years with the help from the people in their 60s and 70s uh, who have more time um, to spare to collaborate with you. Um, and as of this question, I, I think it's a really good question. So what's the difference between idea worth spreading and the ideas that are actually spreading? Uh, and uh, I think the, the main difference uh, is the agency that this idea give to the people who spread it. That is to say, um, how extensible is the idea? Uh, for example, uh, during the mask uh, use uh, public communication, we found that the jurisdictions that said wear a mask to protect the elderly, that idea was spreading didn't spread. Uh, if they say wear a mask to protect the frontline health workers, again, was spreading didn't spread. And because uh, this appeal to altruism, first of all, is just for a segment of society. If somebody doesn't see a doctor or a nurse, if somebody doesn't live with people who are elderly, then they don't have to think about this message at all. Uh, and even if they think about it, it becomes harder for them to extend upon it and share it to other people. So our message in uh, our communication uh, with this famous Shiba Inu uh, sharing the message is that you wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand and a, a dog put a foot into its mouth to illustrate what not to do right so basically that this message spreads because it appeals to rational self-interest it's very easy to remind each other to uh, protect themselves from themselves and but if you say hey um, Audrey uh, please wear a mask to show some respect for the elderly it's very hard actually for you to say that but wear a mask to protect yourself you that comes very naturally so anything that enhances the social solidarity with a kind of a uh, fun meme uh, that goes with it remember the Shiba Inu right uh, all this uh, enhances the virality of the message but the core issue is whether anyone spreading the message can add to the message in an organic way whether uh, it could go viral is uh, depending on how um, how much mutation it can accrue uh, to use a epidemiologic term, uh, how the R value of the idea could spread because of the mutations uh, that it accrue uh, during that. Uh, this question is interesting. 
how do I cultivate the courage of decision making? Um, I, I think one of the uh, main ideas here is that with digital social innovation, you can actually uh, choose many options at once. It's just uh, remembering that it's not you doing all these things. So when, when I'm uh, sharing, for example, about the mask availability map, um, even though many people in Japan thought it's my idea, it's not my idea. <laughs> it's uh, a civic hacker in Tainan, uh, the name is Howard Wu, he already had a map uh, that showed the actually garbage collection uh, schedule. Uh, and there's another civic hacker named Sun Jin Kiang who already had a map that showed the PM 2.5 air quality and air pollution. And so they just changed some parameters to their existing maps and they were able to show the availability of masks in nearby convenience stores and later on pharmacies. And my role, very simply put, is making sure they don't have to prepare the material, the data cleaning and so on by themselves. They don't have to scrape the websites or PDFs. We made sure that the pharmacies publish the numbers every 30 seconds after they sell any uh, copy, not copy, uh, any batch of the mask. They just update uh, the numbers in real time and we didn't approve the uh, message. Uh, it's just like a distributed ledger. As soon as it's committed, it is published. And because of this idea of data pipeline and open API, I don't have to choose to make decisions thinking, oh, do I need to use the line uh, chatbot first? Or do I need to build a website first? Do I need to use an app? What about people who don't have uh, iPhones? Um, I, I don't have to make those decisions because with an open API, people who care about iPhones um, like Siri, I can just say, here's the API. Go and develop the Siri um, add-on for that. If you want Google Assistant, do that. If you don't have a English version, go ahead and make a translation because I'm not the bottleneck in the digital uh, social innovation, the decisions could be entirely deferred to the people who actually need that in the time. And because of that, we understand that people who develop these applications are the real users of the data. And so they become the uh, co-stewards. And this is the competence versus literacy viewpoint. If I think only I get to make the decision, I have to take care of people's literacy. But if I'm not the bottleneck, so everybody gets to make their own decisions. And my role is just to make sure it's available, reliable data, and effective partnership. And so the courage of decision making is to delegate away even the kind of delegations, like what to delegate away. You can even delegate away those decisions um, to, to your community. And this is uh, a very Taoist approach to, to governance, I'm sure. Um, and 24, um, people would like to know about uh, really something that really captured uh, my interest, uh, something that I want to apply to Taiwan. Well, I'm a digital minister at TW, but I'm also slash like seven other board member positions in social innovation organizations worldwide. Uh, so I often say I work with Taiwan, but I'm not working for Taiwan. Taiwan is just one of the jurisdictions that I work with. Uh, and one of the more exciting recent innovations uh, appears in the Ethereum community. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, uh, who is co-board member in uh, Red Exchange with me has been experimenting with this exciting voting mechanism called quadratic voting that we've already applied for our presidential hackathon to source out the synergies between the 169 sustainable targets uh, to much success. And then uh, moving on, uh, Vitalik also experimented uh, with quadratic funding, which is a really good in, uh, new model that is midway between uh, the grants which uh, is one person, one vote, but a small jury panel. Uh, they can't really fund things they don't understand versus crowdfunding, which is one dollar, one vote, uh, but I privilege the people who have a lot of dollars to spare uh, and cannot fund the things of broad public interest uh, that need actually quite some investment, uh, but uh, doesn't have a good PR machine, right? <laughs> and so these two uh, ends of a funding for public good meet in the middle uh, if we use the quadratic funding model and we're very seriously looking into it to see whether our national development fund or other investment um, uh, for impact impact investment vehicles could take uh, some lessons from the Ethereum community in terms of quadratic funding. So that's very much worth looking into. 24 people uh, asks, what comes after the DX? 
Um, I think uh, what's after the DX is probably EX um, because A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and so <laughs> what comes after the D, D transformation must be the E transformation uh, and also uh, slash um, a uh, council member uh, and executive committee member of the collective, um, the Council on Extended Intelligence. So uh, the E stands for extended. <laughs> and uh, extended intelligence uh, means very simply that the machines, instead of taking over um, people's jobs or people's functions in the society, rather we apply machine learning exclusively on the things that enable people to collaborate better, to make participatory design possible, to make sure that there's agency and dignity uh, in the democratic governed uh, data coalitions. And so, for example, our presidential hackathon often produces, in addition to the air quality or mask availability map, there's a map uh, that take a page from the Japanese startup uh, Maimitsu, uh, which is a visualization for nearby drinking stations that you can refill the bottles rather than buying new plastic bottles. But the Taiwanese version instead um, has a very uh, Pokemon Go-like oh, gamification overlay on top of it. So you can collect new gold coins, you can redeem them uh, to the local uh, agricultural products by social enterprises, the national uh, like oil uh, company, the refueling stations, um, double S refueling <laughs> stations. Uh, there's many cross-sectoral collaborations. So it's also a regional revitalization goal uh, that invites people to understand more in uh, impact-oriented tourism and so on, using that as a local feature navigation tool. And so things like that um, are AI but they are AI in the assistive way. That is to say, it, it doesn't replace human-to-human -human connection. Actually, it's uh, about fostering human-to-human -human connection that wouldn't be possible uh, before this transformation. And of course, uh, some people here may have heard of Polis, which again is a AI a project that lets people see their commonalities despite their initial different ideological positions and so on. So all these extended intelligence uh, applications, I think, unlike the uh, previous imagination of digital, which is about connecting machine to machines. These are the digital uh, to the extensive, um, extensible intelligence direction, which is about connecting human beings with human beings and human beings with non-human beings like uh, rivers and mountains via natural personhood, via their digital avatars as shown in the film Avatar uh, and many other things as well. So that's the digital toward extended intelligence um, transformation direction. Um, and so uh, a follow-up question, do you think singularity will really happen? Um, if a singularity is near, uh, the plurality is already here. So to me, sustainability is all about trusting the future generations are going to be smarter than us and they have not yet been born. So we might as well defer the decision <laughs> to the future generations. We make sure we do not foreclose their possibilities. We do not aim for the singularity for this generation and decimate, like re reducing by 10% uh, the agency for future generations. So if we make sure that all the possible directions are possible in multiple singularities, then we have a plurality. And that's why I have really firmly believe that the future generations need to have as much a say to the democratic process as much as possible, which is why the joint platform, as I mentioned, is now more than a quarter of the citizens' initiatives are by the 12 years old, the 13 years old, the 15 years old, because they are literally the next uh, generation. And I think plurality will happen and it will keep happening if we uh, make this intergenerational solidarity part of our uh, culture instead of just pointing to, you know, something agree as a good thing by 50 years old or by me, like 40 years old <laughs> and um, de uh, decimate the future generation's agency. Um, this one is also interesting. In Taiwan, uh, we basically cannot do takedown by the administration. Everybody who remembers the martial law uh, didn't want to go back there. It's just like people who remember the 2003 SARS epidemic in Taiwan didn't want to go back to lockdown because we, we understand lockdown and uh, how traumatic it was for the people in the Hoping Hospital which suffered a, a lockdown in 2003 and we didn't want that. Uh, and so because of that, we have to innovate to find out ways that do not result into a emergency state, uh, a 
lockdown or a takedown in terms of online speech. And so the innovation, in addition to the humor over rumor, uh, the Kyushiba Inu and all that, uh, we also discovered that notice and public notice uh, is very useful. So instead of notice and takedown, which actually polarizes the community because there exist people who do not want it to be taken down. And if it wasn't famous, well, it will become famous after a takedown. It's called a Streisand effect. Um, we, we don't do that. We don't, we don't go there. Instead, uh, we make sure that there is a very easy way, like flagging email as spam. There is a very easy way to flag incoming messages as spam or disinformation or hate speech or whatever. And once you reported that to, uh, for example, the line um, application work with the Taiwan government on a line dashboard that shows uh, what are the top uh, reported um, things, the messages uh, on the line platform. And that's their CSR team. I'm just pasting it into the chat in the Google Media. And you can see, um, for example, like today, as of now, um, there's like 86K uh, thousand um, unique messages uh, with uh, more than 30, uh, 336,000 uh, people participating. So that's a lot of people. Uh, and so some of them are fact-checked already as false. Some of them are gray, meaning that it's still awaiting fact-checking. And uh, there's a bar that shows its virality, like it's our value uh, recently, right? So we focus on the three or so things that are getting viral, but really didn't um, uh, reach a lot of people. Uh, and then fact check it. For example, um, in 2019, before the election in November, there was a message that said, and I quote, uh, the people in Hong Kong are recruiting 13 years olds to murder police and um, you know they're paying $200,000 to them. And some of the uh, young people are recruiting even younger people and they bought iPhones with it, end of quote. So that's an actual uh, crime, criminal uh, disinformation. Uh, manipulation speech that was making the rounds. But instead of taking any of that down, we just trace the photo to the Reuters photo, which is a real photo, uh, and the Taiwan Fact Check Center, which is a nonprofit not funded by the government's um, social sector organization, traced the original alternate caption to the Zhongyang Zheng Fa Wei Chang An Jian, which is the central political and law unit of the Chinese Communist Party's Weibo account. Um, and so instead of taking it down, we just made sure that on Facebook and other social media, that sign on the anti-disinformation of court. Uh, when you share this message, there is mandatory frame around it that says this message is proudly sponsored, well, not proudly, is sponsored uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. And, and that makes sure that everybody gets educated about it. And once they share it, get they get into the mood of a newsroom of fact-checking, source-checking, uh, balancing the narratives rather than a us versus them. Why are the government taking a down mood? Which um, I think the pro-social media, the pro-social side of social media is only possible when everybody see ourselves as a media worker, as a potentially a part-time journalist. So 18 people uh, would like to <coughs> ask what's the strong points of online and offline or in person. Uh, well, I think the online is not just about this two dimensionality. I mean, uh, I can see you quite clearly, actually much more clear than if we have to wear a mask in face-to-face -face settings. Uh, so in a sense, um, this brings us closer, uh, but we can't uh, enjoy bubble tea together, right? So so this is something um, that face-to-face -face setting uh, really shines. Uh, actually, uh, when I work uh, thoroughly through telecommunication, through telework since 2008, uh, 2016, before I joined the cabinet uh, with Silicon Valley companies, they often send uh, like, um, a Napa Valley red wine, uh, not very good red wine, just something that they could buy on the supermarket. And then we would just video conference, but we'll drink exactly the same bottle of wine, uh, well, the same label anyway, uh, and share the taste about it. Uh, or when uh, Gordon Biersch, uh opened in Palo Alto, they'll go there and have a video conference with me and I go to Gordon Biersch Taipei uh, and I make sure that we order the same food and so on. So the food and the drink and the social objects that we share, that is very important important that is fundamental to, to our existence. And uh, with care, of course, we can recreate some of it uh, with a mixture of online and offline experience. But if we do not design that in through augmented reality or um, virtual reality, uh, then we do not have the true sense of co-presence. And uh, in this video conference, for example, most of you are in your rooms. So, so I don't see much beyond the rooms. And all the rooms looks alike, right? But when I uh, did a video conference, 
conference, a similar uh, lecture uh, and Q&A with, um, I think, some uh, Korean uh, rural uh, city. Um, I was traveling from Taipei to Yilan, and I was mounting uh, the phone uh, in a wide angle camera uh, in a car. I was sitting in the back seat, and the camera was taking in everything that the rear window um, has to, to offer. Uh, and because of the 5G connection and the low latency, it feels like everybody is on the same car with me, <laughs> where I can introduce uh, the landscape, uh, the, the mountains, the view, and, and so on. And, and that, I think, uh, the co-presence, the existence in the same physical place uh, is really important to get people into the feeling of co-creation together instead of just information exchange. So with some uh, participatory design, I'm sure that we can enhance our communications and lives with the best thing about online, which is unlimited um, connections across time zones and across jurisdictions, and the offline part, which is all about the food and the drinks and the beautiful landscape. Um, so 18 people. Uh, well, this is a really good question. How to get young citizens more motivated? In, in Taiwan, what worked uh, for us is this reverse mentorship idea. And when I was um, under 35 years old and therefore qualify as a uh, youth, uh, I was invited to the cabinet level by the minister with a portfolio, Jacqueline Tsai at the time, as a reverse mentor to her on crowdsourced agenda setting and crowdsourced uh, lawmaking. It's very interesting because when you are a reverse mentor, when people call you um, at the time I was called Qing Nian Gu Wen, right? The the, the youth consultant. Um, then um, what whatever we were demonstrating, uh, it's not a protest anymore because this title calls upon us to solve the problem that we point out, right? We have to point out the directions uh, in, in order to solve the problem that we highlight during the sunflower movement. And when I become the digital minister in charge of youth engagement, we promoted uh, the, the Gu Wen, the consultant, into full um, zi xun wei yuan. So uh, met the full member, like a legislator, a full member uh, of the Youth Advisory Council, so we call them cabinet counselors, uh, and that's even more duty uh, in implied in that position. And even when they're just 19 years old, 20 years old, once they become a cabinet level advisory counselor, um, they understand that it's their job to point the new directions for the country. And we, the older people, I'm old now, right? I'm almost 40 now. Uh, we, the older people, are the people who need to empower them so they make the direction cause and we give them the resources and power needed uh, to make their ideas a reality. So, so I think this is the Pygmalion effect. If you uh, expect 20 years old to behave like states people, then they behave like states people. If you expect 20 years old to behave like babies, well, they behave like babies. And it's all <laughs> implied in the position and in the culture. And finally, I think we have the, the last question now. Um, yeah, Facebook sells uh, addictive products. Uh, I, I don't think as a liquor content comp company, I say uh, something like a, a nightclub, so something like a host or hostess bar. So, so there is, of course, some selling of addictive drinks, but there's also private bouncers, very loud music, karaoke, and all that. <laughs> and it's hard to have a real civic town hall style deliberation over that loud music, not to mention the private bouncers that will escort you you out, right? Uh, and so um, that's, of course, part of the, the nightlife scene. There is a uh, existence um, rationality for them to exist. Uh, there are nightlife requirements uh, for people. Uh, but what's important, I think, is for the government to recognize there's more places in city planning than the nightlife district. Uh, there are uh, places that we dedicated to the town halls, the public parks, the civic halls, the public libraries, the universities and other places of education institutions. Uh, the National Park is a very large place, right? Uh, and so all these are worth the investment into the public infrastructure. And one of the things that um, Minister of Culture, Zhen Li Jun, and yours truly uh, helped to do in 2016 was to convince our National Budgeting Office to consider such digital infrastructure uh, worthy of the uh, infrastructure budget in the infrastructure bill. It's a special budget. Previously, our accounting uh, people in the National Budgeting Office 
only considered as infrastructure, something tangible, something concrete, like literally made of concrete. Otherwise, everything else um, is uh, considered uh, just regular expense and not worthy of the infrastructure uh, moniker. But we eventually uh, convince them that if it's in the commons, if everybody can reuse it, if it serves a civic purpose, then it is also digital public infrastructure. So within the entire infrastructure bill, there is this, this section called digital, and only within this section, uh, the intangible stuff could qualify as public investment on digital public infrastructure. And that is important because then people can go to the joint platform. They, uh, when they want to um, relax and deliberate on something of public concern, they don't have to go to the, the more sh uh, you know shouting, uh, intoxicating part of the digital lifestyles. And that is what enabled, for example, Dr. Li Wenliang's message uh, to reach the Taiwanese people in just 24 hours because that happened on PTT, which is public infrastructure subsidized entirely um, by the national government uh, and run by university students for 25 years now. And we made sure that they don't have to answer to shareholders or to advertisers. It's entirely a social place uh, for part of the civic life. And I'm sure that Li Wenliang's message also reach other SNS, but maybe because there's more noise than signal, it did not end up in the same result as what we have seen in Taiwan. And so I believe we are at time. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you very much for your precious time. And uh, we will see you again in September. Yep, yep, that we will do. And until then, live long and prosper. <laughs> Bye, everyone. You too. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.